Okay, we want to continue with our study of Abraham. You'll remember that we said when we started into that study that uh, the life of Abraham is unfolded to us. And I think, what was it, five different appearances that God made to him. And uh, each time he appeared to him, there was something different going on in his life. All of it is a study of faith. If ever you studied any one person out of the Bible and can say it was a study of faith, it would be Abraham. Not to say others aren't there that show forth great faith in God. Hebrews 11 makes it clear that's the case. But Abraham is always called by inspiration the father of the faithful. And uh, that's still how we want to look at this. Now, we finished up that little survey, and that's all it really was meant to be as we studied these different periods in Genesis about uh, Father Abraham. And now I want to go on into uh, lessons that what we've learned. Now, some of these we mentioned in going through the text, but uh, we'll be mentioning uh, them again, I'm sure. And uh, these all will be valuable when we apply them to our life as Christians and realize that faith, whether it's patriarchal age, the mosaic dispensation, or the Christian age, is always formed in a person in the same way and always reveals itself in the same way. And that's what is the point a great many people don't realize. One of the things I do want to emphasize more and more, it doesn't mean I don't think you don't know it, but to give an emphasis, that is Abraham lived before the law of Moses. Never knew a thing about the law of Moses. Abraham lived before the New Testament system. Yet he's the father of the faithful. The law of Moses was a pure law system. But we are children of God by the same faith that Abraham was a servant of God. Because the system that is the New Testament system is a system of faith. A law system means every single solitary law in it must be kept perfectly. If you stumble at one point, the whole body of law condemns you. And thus, when you read through Romans, you'll see Paul telling them, that uh, the law made sin exceedingly sinful. What does that mean? Well, it means it made uh, you keenly aware of what it was to break God's will and that you were condemned when you did it and that you could not live under a perfect law system. Peter said in Acts 15, said it was a yoke that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. But it was designed to impress people with the fact you need a savior, and it can't be one. It can't come through a perfect law system. Now, we have the perfect law of liberty. That is the New Testament, a system of faith. We're not saying there's not any law to the New Testament. One of the big problems that exists today in the denominational world concerning Salvation by grace is that they think it rules out any law. Well, that's just not the case. Paul said to Timothy, or rather to Titus, that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. I watch, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldliness, and so on. The grace of God came teaching. That was Jesus. There are things to follow. Jesus said, why call you me, Lord, Lord, do not the things which I say. Well, see how that is, is brought out over and over again in the life of faithful Abraham. I listened to a fellow, quite a brilliant fellow, today for a while, and he was talking about Galatians 3. And he was just as confused as he could be. He didn't know he was confused, of course, but he was. He kept talking about Abraham and I were saved by the faith of Abraham today under the gospel and all that. Man wasn't a member of the church, although nowadays he could have been. Uh, and lo and behold, he read right through Galatians 3.27 that we're baptized to Christ. And uh, he never caught it. He never worked that into his system because he was fighting law so much and grace only that he couldn't see that 
The faith that saves has always been the faith that obeys, Hebrews 5, 9. Patriarchal age, faith that saves, faith that obeys. Mosaical age, the faith that saves, faith that obeys. Christian age, the faith that saves, the faith that obeys. And then James says, faith apart from works is dead. Well, you know, it can't be meritorious work. Any of the works of obedience that Abraham submitted to were not meritorious works. And they were not uh, working out something some men had worked out. He was simply responding to what God told him to do. So his faith, that is the first emphasis we'll make here, though we've been making it, his faith caused him to move as God directed him. Any faith that will not cause a person to move as God in his word directs us, the wrong faith is a faith that's no good, it's pointless. He left his homeland. Why? Why did he leave his home? I told him to. He traveled as God directed him. Why did he go to these places? I told him to. He was willing to offer his son. Why? He was so instructed. And you look over to Hebrews 11, and you'll see that uh, he cited by uh, inspiration as being one of the great, marvelous examples of faithful service to God. Now, why is that there? So we are to be faithful in the same way. We shouldn't just study this about Abraham in the Old Testament and just stand back amazed at his faith. We should realize God's saying, that's what I expect you to be. That's there for your learning. And inspiration reaches over there and puts it into the New Testament in Hebrews 11 and in other places, such as in Galatians. So our faith must cause us to move on as God directs us. We say it many times this way, that uh, we're to act in the name of Christ by his authority. We're to do all things by the authority of Christ. And we do that to try to say, well, I've got to know how the New Testament of Christ authorizes me to act. How does the Bible authorize? How do I ascertain that authority? Well, it's the same thing. It just comes at us differently. God dealt with the patriarch, the head of the family, the father, and he did it in different ways, dreams, speaking directly to them, but it's still the will of heaven being conveyed to them. So we walk by faith, Paul says, not by sight. I think it's interesting to note that when he says we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, then he's, he's talking about uh, when he says sight, he lets one of our five senses stand for all of our physical senses. Some people view nothing but what, through what they can smell, taste, see, touch, hear. That's it. They're sensual. That's what it amounts to. Sensual. That's what appeals to them. And of course, if that's the case, and the lust of the flesh, and lust of the pride of life, it's going to mean a whole lot to them, but they don't see beyond that. They don't see the truth of God, so they're blinded to it. And remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10 17. And one cannot please God without faith, Hebrews eleven six. 6. So we see then, even as it is taught in the life of Abraham, we see if we emulate Abraham, then we must not go beyond, we must not fall short of, or we must not seek to change God's word. We just noticed that in our lesson a little while ago, 2 John 9. And it's throughout the whole of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Revelation 22, 18, 19, we're not to add to or take away from. It, we're to learn it as it is and do it. It is complete as God has completed it. Another lesson is that Abraham's faith was such as to enable him to hope against hope. Interesting way of saying things. He was 99 years old when God again specifically told him that he would have a son. I want you to think about that a little bit. Paul says that Abraham's body was as good as dead, Romans 4, verse 19. 
And uh, Sarah evidently was naturally barren all her life. Yet God promised that he and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, would have a son. Some people, I think, read that and think, well, God just worked another miracle. There's no miracle involved in the birth of Isaac. Now, think for a minute. God set the law of procreation. I don't need to say any more of this, all this, than what the law of procreation is. What that's saying is that Abraham, when he was beyond procreating, believed God so much he did, exactly what it amounted to. That's why it talks about him as a man of faith. So God promised Abraham, believed it, he hoped against hope. Engaged in the act of procreation with a wife who had been barren all her life, and now they're way past childbearing age. And guess what? God kept his promise. So there's wonderful hope that he had, marvelous hope. So Paul says, who in hope believed against hope, the end that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which he had, had been spoken. So shall thy seed be. And without being weakened in faith, he considered his own body now as good as dead, he being about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, looking under the promise of God, he wavered not through unbelief, but waxed strong through faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Romans 4, 18 through 21. I don't, I think people read that today and don't realize no what that's saying. He was past being able to sire a, a child, and she never had been able to. Yet he believed because God promised and faith comes by hearing the word of God and he walked by faith and not by sight and Isaac was born. There's a whole lot said there. We just read over and never really get what's being said. Another great lesson is that his faith was such as compelled him. Now to be compelled to do something is when you're made to do it. And his trust, faith, belief in God compelled him to obey God. And that's brought over to the New Testament. As James writes to Christians, in James 2, 21 through 24. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed to go out into a place which he was to receive for inheritance. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. On that, with that backdrop, we come to James. And the faith that uh, avails divine blessings is always, always, never failed to be a living, active, obedient faith. So, as I said, James says, was not Abraham our father, justified by works? And that he offered up, offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Thou seest that faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. That means complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Ye see that by works man is justified, and not by faith only. James 2, 21 and 20, uh, through 24. So again, we are seeing him being directed by God. He couldn't be directed by God if he didn't have a submissive spirit. He was humble before God. So likewise, our faith must be an obedient faith. It's too bad that people can't see that these things are here, like the man I listened to today, who was reading all over the place, but he's so hung up on grace only, faith only, 
It reads right through that we're baptized into Christ. And then at the end of that chapter, it just says we're seed that we're, we're children of Abraham. Well, children of Abraham are people who obey what they believe in. That's the point. Now, another lesson. His faith was strong enough to enable him to overcome the problem of human reasoning and judgment. Human reasoning and judgment. Now, what I mean by that? Well, because of his faith, he was willing to comply with the demands of God, even though those demands would not be in harmony with human reasoning and human judgment. The command to offer Isaac as a burnt offering was not in harmony with human reasoning. In fact, it goes even against God in other places. Any other time you'd sin if you'd done things like God commanded Abraham to do. Sometimes tests of faith are distasteful to us. And at other times they're actually wrong if people do them. Well, the command to offer Isaac was not in harmony with human reason. It was a complete contradiction to the very promise that God had made. Now think about it for a minute. Through Isaac shall thy seed be blessed. Make of him, through him, you a great nation. Now take him and kill him. Well, you imagine how many people that would have uh, ruled out in our day and time when people are still asking who are supposed to be Christians, do I have to attend every service in the church? So Things like that just absolutely amaze me, but these are the fundamentals, and by not understanding them is the reason they don't understand a lot of other things. It was contrary to God's emphasis upon respect for human life. It was complete contradiction to fatherly love and affection what God had commanded, what Abraham do, he obeyed. Now, we must understand that many of God's commands are out of harmony with human reasoning, human judgment. Baptism is one of them. Well, I think God could forgive me this way, that way, or the other. It's not a matter what God could do. It's a matter of what he said in his word he wouldn't do. That's simple. Some of God's commands are even contrary to human reasoning and judgment, uh, even today in the church and baptism, there you are. But when you teach it, that's one of the first hurdles you've got to get people over. If they would just look at Abraham and study him. They'd see that the faith that saves is always the faith that obeys long before you ever get to the New Testament and any of the differences that exist. And I would say to members of the church who are studying the Bible with people before you ever get into all these denominational differences, you can point out here that when did Abraham's faith save him? It was when he obeyed. And then when you get over the New Testament, all those things that pertain to what one must do to be saved, et cetera, you're going to remind them way back over here. We saw how that faith saved somebody when that person's faith led him to obedience. So it helps a lot in trying to convert people if we maybe just use the Bible like it was written. Faith means one, and, and I'm rehearsing here what I've said in sermons many times, doing what God says do, doing it, number two, in the way he says do it, And because he said do it, sometimes I don't emphasize that part. Uh, why do we do what we do? Because he said so. A lot of times people don't want to hear that, but that's what happened when it came to Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, why did you offer Isaac? He can simply have said because God said so. Noah, why did you build the ark the way you built the ark? Why did you even build an ark? Where did the concept of an ark come from? 
because God said so. Why do you sing praises to God in the worship assemblies without any mechanical instrument of music or any other kind of music other than singing? Simple. Because God said so. But I am willing to do what God says do just because God says do it. Now I'm developing the kind of faith of Abraham or the kind he had. Another point is his faith was such that it caused him to fasten his life upon eternity itself and heaven in eternity. We often talk about the eye of faith. Well, he had a vision. He, he could see things through taking God at his word. His faith produced that vision, and it included the heavenly home. Paul says, for if so be Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, he said he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11, 10. Now, now think of that for a moment. He looked for a city which hath foundation. You know where most people are looking for something to hold on to? They're looking this world. And yet what is said here is that there are no real foundations in anything in this world. Abraham knew he was a pilgrim in this world. Abraham knew he's just passing through. And so he looked for a permanent place. There's nothing permanent in this world. Not a thing in the world permanent in this world. Some may last longer than others, but all of them are going, are, are, are going to be gone. And someday the whole system will be gone. Paul speaks of Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and says, but now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed of them, be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hebrews 11 and verse 16. I want you to think about that for a moment. God is not ashamed of a certain class of human beings. Who are they? They're like Abraham. Think what we quote so often about the importance of studying the scriptures, studying to show thyself approved unto God. The idea is be studious. Uh, give your all to it. Study show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be what? Be ashamed. Oh, what is said right here? There's a class of people God's not ashamed of. Who are they? The faithful children of God. That's why James would refer to Abraham as the friend of God. It's a group of people that are called friends of God. God's not ashamed of them. They're his children. That's a wonderful thought. And when you think of the perfection of God, the holiness of God, the glory of God, the majesty of God, the power of God, and you can be a human being who was created in his image, who sinned and needed salvation, and found it in belief and obedience to the gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, and become a friend of God. That's an amazing thing. And he'll say through his son on the day of judgment to those folks he's not ashamed of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So we're seeing then that this faithful business, if I'm to understand it, look at Abraham, father of the faithful. And you know what Christ is saying. Their faith was always a faith that led them to obey what God said to do. But at least on the surface, this reading of Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where God said to Abraham, I'll make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great. I'll curse those that curse you. Bless them that bless you. I'll bless all the families of the earth and you, the seed that will come through you. Well, think about those promises. I'll make thee a great nation. I'll bless thee. 
those that bless thee, curse those that curse thee. I will make thy name great. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's an amazing statement. And I want to hearken back to what I've said in the other lessons. Remember, Abraham only had what we, what, uh, of the whole idea of the scheme of redemption, what's revealed in the book of Genesis. And yet he displayed such great faith. And it had to be, as I said earlier, only because he had the understanding that if it's God saying it and it means me, then I won't question it. I will just act. In Genesis chapters 4 and 5, the messianic line is traced for us from Adam through Seth, who took Abel's place, down to Noah. So in Noah, what we have is the preservation of the messianic line. In chapters 10 and 11, that line is traced through Noah, through Shem, down to Abraham. And God says to Abraham, you're, you're in the line. There have been situations where you stood in line a long time. Somebody says, hey, if you want to get that, you've got to be in this other line. That's going to happen on dead judgment with all these people in human churches and false philosophy. You're in the wrong line. You can't be in the line of yours. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So you have to know the unfolding of the scheme of redemption because it's all fulfilled in the New Testament. And he's going to develop his descendants into a great nation. When I think about what, what you have to have to have a nation, a kingdom, you have to have a people. And when we think about the kingdom of Christ, it has to be strong in its character, in its spiritual status. And two, there's a law, of course, govern it. There has to be knowledge and experience in the use of that law. And uh, there has to be a land as far as nations of this world is concerned. Well, when he works this thing out down through history, he explains it on a level of human beings to understand. And he does it in a way that human beings can grasp. So God multiplies the descendants of Abraham. He takes them down into Egypt because now remember, time doesn't mean a thing in the world of God. He does use it and he gives people time to develop and that's what he did when he allowed the Israelites to develop as he did in bondage down in Egypt. Then there comes a time when he leads them out of Egypt through Moses. And we won't take the time now, but I'll say it again for emphasis sake. While they were in Egypt under bondage all those years, they were developing. Even though those 20 years old and upward, but for two, died in the wilderness wandering once they got across the Red Sea. Point is, is that there had to be a desire and there had to be time for that thing to develop. You look at Israel when it kept sinning with its idolatrous worship. It took a long time, but God burnt idolatrous worship out of them when he put them in 70 years of Babylonian captivity. So time does play a part in things. So we watch them as God takes the people of Israel across the Jordan and gives them their land. They have a law from Mount Sinai. I think it should be pointed out that in relationship to each of these three, shall we call them component parts of the Abrahamic covenant, people, law, and land is what I mean by that. There are three distinct aspects. There is the physical aspect. 
That's number one. Number two, there is the spiritual aspect. Number three, there is the typical aspect. Now, you get on Hebrews, you'll really see that typical aspect. Of course, they were a physical people. We know that. But they sustained a definite spiritual relationship to God. And the faithful of that number will be in heaven. Finally. But these people were a type of spiritual Israel, the New Testament church. And that's important to understand. The law contained many features, which definitely were physical. But the law of justice definitely related to spiritual matters. And this law of Moses was a type, a shadow of the law of Jesus Christ. Notice as they, flesh the Israel, as they heard Moses, we must hear the Christ. That was part of the early preaching done, Acts 3, 22 and 23, especially when they were preaching to the Jews. The land was physical, literal land. But this land was distinctively involved in a spiritual relationship to God. This land was a type of, first of all, the rest, which is to be had in Jesus Christ. And two, our, shall we call it, Canaan rest, heaven itself. And we sing songs along that line even today employing those terms of the old testament as types on jordan's stormy banks i stand and cast a wishful eye canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie so every person who's been baptized into jesus christ is involved in the real meaning of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. In this connection, the Apostle Paul speaks in Galatians 3, 27 and 29. Now we're back to that poor fellow this afternoon who walked all around it and fell over it and all of that, but never saw that. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. And he said, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Here's another point that we might have time to get in back. Abraham was one in whose life God came first. He put God above his native land. He put God above his father's house. He put God above his kindred. He placed God above natural affection and above common human reason. We have the obligation. We have, as it were, the sacred privilege of putting God first in our life. We labor all our life as members of the church. In fact, we wouldn't be a true member of the church if we hadn't put God first in our life. But then we labor the rest of our lives as new creatures in Christ trying to always do what God wants us to do before anything else. That's our whole reason for existing. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, verse 33. Abraham was a man of unusual vision. In fact, his faith included vision. Notice he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Too often members of the church try to judge things as ordinary humans do about how they do stuff and how it's going to work out. If God has told us to do something, we're not supposed to try to say, well, I just don't see how he can do it. 
and I'm not going to do a thing about it until I do. And you won't go to heaven. It's that simple. Whether we're reading in the Old Testament or in the New Testament about men who accomplished so much for God in their service to him, then we're reading about men and women who are characterized by a great and wonderful vision. The faith of Moses also included such a vision. The scripture says, for he looked under the recompense a reward, and he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews 11, 26 and 27. You think Moses knew much about Abraham? That's kind of a silly question. So God's people being faithful like Abraham must be unusual in their vision. Elders of the churches must be men of tremendous vision. They can't view things like the world does. Members of the church must work hard to encourage the elders to be characterized by great vision. They can't let things handicap them like people who are out of this world. We must hope and pray, plan and work with regard to the church not only today, but especially a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 25 years from now, whatever it is, you see Abraham's work and how much it flows down thousands of years later, even to us. So what the spring congregation or any congregation will be in the days of children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, is to an alarming degree based upon the vision and the strength of the members of the church here today, and especially the eldership, very much so. The Lord said to his disciples, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, that they are white already. And the harvest, John 4, 35. Well, I think we'll stop here, and we'll stop with a prayer, if you'll bow with me. Our Holy Father, we're thankful for such great people as Abraham. It helps us understand our approach to thee, and to thy word, and to thy commandments. Help us to abide in Christ faithful. May we grow in the faith that Abraham exemplified in thee. Feed us in evil, raise us up in good. Help us to love the truth more each day, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For we ask this prayer in his name. Amen.